During the darkest years of the Ancient Age, the Elfhead, a slave race, tore off their chains. Joining forces with the divinely guided Andraste and her army of righteous barbarian tribesmen, they brought their former Tevinter slave masters to their knees. For their efforts, the elven people were given a homeland of their own for the first time in millennia. And yet, three centuries later, the very same religion the elves had helped create had returned to their doorstep. In a firestorm of religious and ethnic turmoil, the culture, faith and identity of the ancient Elfhen would once more be pushed to the brink of extinction. In this latest episode on the world of Dragon Age, we will cover the exalted March on the Dales. Thinking about all this lore as a creator, keeping it in check as you build, interlink and then use the world for storytelling can be a tall order. It's the sort of project where you'll want our sponsor, World Anvil. World Anvil is the ultimate world-building toolset and RPG campaign manager. It packages the whole creative process together, providing tools for organizing maps, developing encyclopedias of lore, and writing content that connects in. Having all these facets of the creative process all together will make your project easy to distribute, collaborate on, and ultimately monetize. It's perfect for running all kinds of role-playing campaigns, loads of rule sets are natively supported, and more are on the way. And now they have a new D&D Beyond character importer, which brings D&D Beyond characters into the World Anvil character manager almost instantly. A great way to preserve characters in the current D&D climate. It can be done in as little as a few seconds, so make sure to try it out. Even away from the tabletop, the wiki-like database of lore, interactive maps, character sheets, timelines and relationship diagrams make writing your best-selling fantasy novel much easier. You can check out World Anvil via our link in the description. If you use our code WIZARDS, they'll give you 40% off all recurring memberships. So support our channel and your imagination by taking a look. Before exploring the fall of the second elven homeland, we should dial back the clock and recap its entire history. After successfully liberating the whole of southern Thedas, then betraying his wife to the Empire to secure his land gains, Mafarath, the Grand Chieftain of the Alamari kept his massive new holdings in the family, dividing them between himself and his three sons, with one exception. As a reward for fighting alongside Andraste's faithful against the Imperium, Mafarath decreed that the Elves would have a homeland of their own, granting them the lush, thickly forested land of the Dales, located in what is now southeastern Orlay. Across northern Thedas, hundreds of thousands of Elfhen the overwhelming majority of whom were born into slavery and grew up in chains, began walking to their new promised land. Many died on this trek, which involved cutting across thousands of miles of treacherous untamed wilderness. Set upon by human bandits and wild animals while perishing from exposure and starvation, many began to despair and consider returning to their imperial masters. At least in Tevinta, they said, we had food, water and shelter. What do we have here? Nothing but the open sky and the prospect of the never-ending road ahead. And although some individuals would peel away from the flock and return to their masters, the vast majority's resolve never broke and they made it to their destination. There, they founded the city of Halamshiral, which in the ancient elvish tongue means the end of the journey. Finally independent once more, the Elves were finally free to return to the ancient ways of ancient Elfenan, speak their original tongue, and worship their original gods. However, this was easier said than done. Countless generations of slavery under the Tevinters had stripped the Elven people of most of their language, culture and history. What survived was a patchwork of folk stories, legends, and a smattering of words and phrases of the old elvish tongue, passed down in secret from slave mothers to slave children. The Haren, or Elders of the Dales, did their best to gather up all of these scraps of remaining knowledge and stitch them back up into a coherent tapestry. Despite this, many of the truths of ancient Elfhanan were now lost. For instance, the Elves of the Dale worshipped the Evanaris, the nine supreme beings of the Elven Pantheon. They believed the Evanaris to be benevolent gods who bestowed their ancient forebears with the gifts of the earth, with Sales the Hearthkeeper having given the Elves the gift of fire, 
Dirthamen, the Keeper of Secrets, having given the Elves the gift of knowledge, June, God of the Craft, having given the Elves the gift of artisanship, and so on. The Dalish Elves also believed that Fenharal was an evil trickster who, out of jealousy and malicious treachery, deceived the Evanaris into sealing themselves away in the Fade, known to them as the Beyond, which is ultimately why the ancient Elfhen lost their immortality, why Alathan fell, and why the ancestors of the Dalish were condemned to a millennium of slavery. The fact that the Evanaris were not true gods, but simply extremely powerful mages, that they had not been benevolent beings, but instead tyrannical despots, and that Fenharal was more akin to a freedom fighter than a scheming trickster, were all truths that had been lost to time. In spite of the fact that this new nation's perception of its people's history was more fairy tale than reality, it still became a kingdom that achieved a level of beauty and sophistication that only the elves were capable of. Within a few generations, the Dales had become a land of marble palaces and gardens, woven seamlessly into the natural woodland landscape. It was a far cry from ancient Elfenan, which had been a literal dreamscape that transcended metaphysical dimensions, but it was a land of beauty nonetheless. The Elves were of course armed. Never again would they be slaves, and to protect their freedoms, they founded the Emerald Knights, an order of warriors devoted to protecting the borders of the Dales. Each knight rode into battle atop a type of sacred deer, called a Hala, with a wolf companion who fought at their side. Initially, the relationship between the Dalish nation and their tribal human neighbours was good. After all, both the elves and southern menfolk had been tempered in the same baptism of fire, fighting side by side to win their freedom from the Tevinter Imperium. Yet the elves would soon discover that human memory can be short, especially when clouded by the righteousness of religious zealotry. As we have covered previously, in the centuries after Andraste's martyrdom, the world of humans underwent a rapid metamorphosis, as the invincible warlord Dracon forged the mighty Orlesian Empire through fire and blood, spreading his version of the Andrastian faith by the point of a spear, and founding the Chantry, the religious institution which would come to govern the vast majority of humanity on Thedas. Emperor Dracon considered himself a righteous uniter, but the elves looked upon his aggressively expansionist policies with alarm, seeing echoes of tyrannical despotic Tevinter in the newly ascendant Orle. As such, the Dalish kingdom severed diplomatic ties with their human neighbours and adopted a policy of near-total isolationism. The growing enmity was mutual. It was a core Andrastian belief that only when the chant of light had spread to all the peoples of Thedas would the Maker return to the world and make it a paradise. By now, almost all humans were adherents of either the Olesian or Tevinta chantries, but the non-human peoples of the continent were not. The dwarves of Orzammar were not a realistic target for proselytization for the Maker's faithful. The stout mountain dwellers were the continent's chief supplier of priceless lyrium, a crucial trade which could be disrupted if the church eyed the dwarves by insisting on sending missionaries into their lands. No such commercial interests protected the Dalish kingdom, who, despite having been founded by slaves who had once fought alongside Andraste herself, had turned their backs on the word of the Maker and re-embraced the heathen idols of their misguided ancestors. Tensions between Orle and the Dales worsened after the outbreak of the Second Blight, during which the Elfhen refused to help the Olesians, maintaining their strict policy of isolationism, even as the lands of their neighbours were reduced to a wasteland. It is even said that in the year 25 of the Divine Age, when the Darkspawn besieged the Olesian city of Montsumar, an elven army watched on a nearby hill and did nothing. After Ole emerged from the Blight, bloodied but victorious, the Chantry began sending missionaries into the Dales. When these priestesses were turned away, the Chantry sent armed Holy Templars into elven lands in their place. By the end of the Divine Age and the beginning of the Glory Age, human elven tensions were pressurized to explode as the Chantry began spreading lies about elves using human infants as sacrifices in blood rituals. Soon, small-scale skirmishes became common along the border between the Dales and Orle. As is so often the case, 
The road to total war was paved in a story of misunderstanding and personal tragedy. In the ninth year of the Glory Age, an elven woman was killed, murdered by human hunters for having unknowingly strayed over the Olesian border. Siona, the woman's sister and an emerald knight, swore vengeance in a fit of rage and grief. In this, she sought the aid of her brother, Alandrin, who was also an emerald knight. Alandrin refused. As much as he grieved for losing his youngest sister, he refused to raise a finger against humankind. Later, it was revealed why. He had fallen in love with Adeline, a human girl from the town of Red Crossing. Siona was blinded by rage. She had lost one sibling to human swords. She would not suffer to lose another to the human god. With a commando unit of Emerald Knights, she rode to Red Crossing to find her brother and force him to come home. When they arrived at the hamlet, they were greeted by Adeline, rushing towards the elves with a letter in her hand. She would never get to read it out. Without hesitation, Siona ordered her men to open fire, and Adeline was instantly riddled with arrows and killed. Her screams roused some of the village folk, who grabbed their pitchforks and charged the elves, but they were no match and were cut down as well. As more humans poured out of their homes, Siona and her crew became outnumbered and were forced to retreat. Only then did Alandrin emerge to be met with the corpse of the woman he loved. Even in death, he refused to leave his lover's side. To the vengeful humans, it made no difference. A pointed ear was a pointed ear, and Alandrin was butchered in revenge for his sister's atrocities. The letter in Adeline's clutches, written by his hand, forever going unread. Adeline, what care have I for gods I have never seen, for a maker I do not know? Let others distract themselves with such lofty concerns. I know only this life, I have seen only this world, and I care only for you. Perhaps your priestess distrusts the sincerity of uncivilized elves. If she must hear me say I will follow the maker, so be it. Your god intercedes as much as ours. My life will not change. I will return in two weeks' time. My heart longs for you till then, and will remain with you forever after. Alandrin. After the massacre at Red Crossing, the Empire of Orlais declared war on the Kingdom of the Dales, and the contest for the fate of the Elfhen began. The Elves struck fast and struck hard, storming out of their forests astride their Warhalla and blitzing into Olesian land. In 210 glory, the Emerald Knight Vaharal fell upon the city of Montsimar and captured it in a lightning strike. As the Elves continued to storm through eastern Orlais and maraud ever closer to the capital of Val Royo, Panic spread throughout the empire. In response, Divine Renata I of the Chantry declared an exalted march, a holy war, inviting all the other Andrastian nations to take up arms against the heathen elves. However, none of the other human nations provided their troops, leaving Orlais to handle their own affairs. By the end of 214 glory, elven armies had reached Val Royo, subjecting the city to a brutal sack and plundering the sacred tomb of Emperor Cordilius Dracon I, taking his arms and armor back to Halamshiral to be displayed as trophies. This was a crippling blow to the great Andrastian Empire, but it was not its end. Orlais was a huge country, with vast reserves of manpower and resources to call upon, manpower which their opponents simply could not match. Indeed, although the Dalish had won almost every battle thus far, Every elven life lost in those engagements was felt sorely, while for every Olesian soldier cut down, there were three more peasants in the countryside ready to be conscripted. By using attrition to their advantage, the Olesian armies were eventually able to regroup and turn the tide. Eventually, they liberated Val Royo and began pushing eastwards, pushing the Elfhen out of Orlais before advancing into the Dales. The Emerald Knights made the Andrastians pay a court in blood for every inch they advanced into the Elvish forests, but they could not stop the human advance. By 220 glory, Olesian and Chantry banners were flying before the walls of Halamshiral, and soon after, the Elven capital fell. Even after this, the Dalish refused to surrender. The last holdouts of the Elvish army, led by the Emerald Knight captain Lindarane, retreated to a place called Dirthavaran to make a final stand. 
Here they faced down an Orlesian army, led by the warrior priestess Amity, champion of the Chantry. The elves were cut down to the last man and woman, Lindarane was slain, and with her death, so too did the dream of elven freedom die once more. At the conclusion of the exalted march, the Dalish kingdom was dismantled, and its lands were annexed by the Empire of Orlais, which established human settlements across the former elven domain. The shrines to the elven gods were struck down throughout the dales, and the chant of light was sung. The faithful rejoiced, for the word of the Maker had finally reached this corner of the earth, and thus he was one step closer to returning. As for the elves themselves, whose fate now lay in the hands of the Chantry, Sister Amity had this to say. Even Mafarath the Betrayer had a part to play. Who are we to say the elves do not? The elves were guilty of the greatest sin, of turning from the Maker. But we will show them mercy, for that is what Andraste teaches. For the heirs of Alathan, this mercy was a bitter pill to swallow. They were subject to mass deportation, forced to disperse throughout the land and live in squalid, walled-off sections of human cities, called alienages, where they were treated like second-class citizens. Moreover, they were forced to fully assimilate into human society by abandoning their old gods and converting to Andrastianism, undoing all the work the Dalish kingdom had done to revive the ancient knowledge of Elfenan, and condemning the elvish language, culture and religion to a slow and pitiful extinction. The elves would not be enslaved people, as they had when their first homeland fell to the Tevinter Imperium, but they became a ghettoized people all the same. Some, however, refused this fate. Rather than submitting to Andrastian mercy, they banded together into nomadic clans and committed to roaming the continent as a homeless, stateless people. These itinerant wandering tribes, known as the Dalish clans for their second lost homeland, would continue to reject the human god. It would be in them that the last vestiges of elven religion and language lived on. Life among the nomadic Dalish was tough, and they were reviled as a pariah people in most lands, but they survived nonetheless, and continue to roam throughout Thedas to this day. With elven independence vanquished for the last time, and the Dwarven kingdoms content to remain deep under the earth, fighting a perpetual battle with the Darkspawn, the Chantry believed there would be no more obstacles in their objective of spreading the Chant of Light to all four corners of the earth. They would be wrong. In our next episode on the history of the world of Dragon Age, a new player will enter the fold, as the massive, ashen-skinned, horned Kunari arrive upon Theodosian shores with a strictly conformist religion of their own, which they intend to spread by spear and sword. To make sure you don't miss that, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing, as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We will try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video, and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.